on slideshow mode and then we'll we'll get started thank you um so good morning everybody thank you very much for for joining us for what's our final session for strategic farm week for the winter 2020 series um, I hope that you've enjoyed all of the webinars and the videos that we've shared with you throughout the week. Um, just so you know, the podcast was released at eight o'clock this morning, so you can catch up on that as well. Um, and that, that's with uh, a number of our, our research scientists who are working on the trials. And it links quite nicely into the session this morning, um, where we're looking ahead to what we're doing with uh, all three of our strategic cereal farms across the three sites and looking at the Harvest 2021 activity. So Fiona, if we can just move on to the next slide, please. Um, just before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, we are obviously, as you can tell, using a different platform to, to what we usually use for our webinars. Um, and that's really because we want to encourage as much interaction and discussion. It's, you know, so we're all missing that face-to-face -face interaction and, and contact with one another at events. We want to try and replicate that as, as much as we can. Um, but if you could just ask everybody to mute them just whilst um just whilst our speakers are, are presenting um just to, to avoid that that background noise and any in any interference <clears throat> and if you could just keep your cameras switched off that helps with the bandwidth for for the you know for the presentation for the session um but what i will say and i'll, I'll go through how how to use teams in a bit more detail in a moment so we want to encourage as much discussion and interaction um so please do ask questions um and i'll i'll go through that in a, in a minute but when when we come to the questions and when you want to ask something um i'd invite you to to unmute yourself and, and put your camera on so that we can see see who you are and and um, have a really good discussion so the session today is due to finish at 10 o'clock um obviously we'll see how much discussion and how many questions we get in and, and where we get to with time but but that's the overall aim um the session is being recorded um so if you do need to leave early or you want to catch up with with some of the content again you'll be able to watch it back and that'll be available on our on our website after today um you've got the the twitter handle there for hdb serials so you can join in the conversation online um and and follow our twitter page there <coughs> Um, so, so normally we'd go to webinar, what we'd ask you to do if your basis and Rosso um, points application, and we have got basis and Rosso points for this session today, we'd normally ask you to put them into the chat. Um, but actually for this session, because that chat is publicly available, um, I would say if you could please email me, my email's there on the screen, it's emily.pope at hdb.org.uk. You should have all received an email from me anyway with the link to this session. So if you just reply to that with those details. so your basis, um, account number, your name, and then for Neuroso, your name, your member number, date of birth and postcode. <clears throat> so obviously if you're happy to put it in the chat, then, then I can extract it from there, but I can appreciate that that might not be um, the information everyone wants to share publicly. So, so just pop me an email and we'll get those points registered for you. So Fiona, if we just move on to the next slide, I have a quick um, run through how to use Teams. Um, <clears throat> so, you should be able to see this bar that's, that I've highlighted in, in the red rectangle. Um, for me, it's up on the right hand side of my screen, but I appreciate that not everyone has the same version of Teams. But this, you should be able to see the buttons. They might appear in the middle of your screen. And this is where you can control your microphone and, and um, how to ask questions and things. So that first button there that I've highlighted with the arrow, you'll be able to see who else is in, in the session with us. You can see the list of participants. And then on the next slide, I think I've highlighted um, how to ask questions. So there's like a little logo um, as, a, as a message logo. So you can type questions in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that chat. And as I say, when, um, you know, when, when's the best time to ask that question to our speakers? Um, I'll either read it out or come to you directly and just ask you to, to you know, say that question directly to, to the speakers. Um, Alternatively, you can raise your hand. So there's like a little hand symbol. So if you don't want to type it into the chat, you can just raise your hand and I'll be keeping an eye on that and then come to you individually um, in turn to ask your question. Just remember once you have asked your question, just to lower your hand, because otherwise I'll come back to you thinking um, think you've got another question, which is fine if you have. Um, then, yeah, these, um, this next slide, you can see again, red rectangle, this shows you just where to turn your 
video, your webcam um, and your microphone on and off. So, um, so you can use those tools there as well. OK, so the format for today is, um, as I say, to look at our Harvest 2021 trials. We've grouped the activity, as you said, we've got three strategic cereal farms, um, one in the east, one in the west and one up in Scotland. Um, and we've grouped, um, structured this session this morning into the different range of themes that we're looking at. Um, the, tri the individual trials are slightly different between some of the sites, but the overall themes that we're looking at, um, are, you know, there's some commonalities between the different sites. So you can see the programme here. We're going to have a look at a range of topics, including soil health and IPM. We've got quite a lot of work going on around how to reduce pesticide use, whether that's you know, fungicides or um, herbicides. And we're also looking at disease management and nutrition. We've got a big piece of work across all three sites looking at pest and natural enemies. Um, and then in the east and the west, we've got some, some trials that are continuing to look at cover cropping and catch cropping. And then we've got some work on cultivation and marginal land that's coming up next year. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Fiona. Um, we're joined by our three lead researchers this morning who are working at the different sites. Um, so what I'm going to do is hand over to Anne, Will and Fiona and ask them to do a quick introduction of themselves. And then Fiona will take us into the, the presentation um, with some of the work that's going up in Scotland. But I say, if you've got any questions, you know, please feel free to pop them in the chat as we go through um, and, and we can enjoy a good discussion. So Anne, if I hand over to you. Yep. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name's Anne Bogle. I'm a soil scientist at ADAS um, and I've been uh, working actually with AHDB at Strategic Farm East and West over the last uh, uh, couple of years. And um, I'm heading up the, the work at Strategic Farm West, um, supported by a whole team of soil scientists, crop physiologists, uh, plant pathologists, the lot. So that's that's me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Anne. And Will? Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Will Smith, so from NIAB, um, the trials manager, um, and heading up uh, our contribution to Strategic Farm uh, East. Uh, we sort of dabbled and had our toe in the water with the uh, with the strategic farm network over the last few years so we're really pleased to be taking on the whole of the uh, whole of the east and uh, i suppose like Anne, supported by uh, numerous soil scientists uh, entomologists and plant pathologists to deliver the the overwhelming um projects that we've got at, at brian's brilliant thank you and fiona Good morning uh, so i'm fiona burnett uh, from sruc uh, where I'm an applied plant pathologist and I head up the knowledge exchange and impact. So we're really pleased to be working on Valbourne uh, Farm in Fife um, as the strategic farm for Scotland. And obviously, like the others have said, we've got a team behind us um, working on the soil science, um, the beneficial insects and the, the plant health that we're particularly looking at at that site. So I think the plan is that I just plunge into the to the next slide, um, which sets out the kind of you know what we're doing at at the strategic farm in Scotland is the baselining of the the soil health and the plant health, and then working on the links there. So that's a really interesting area, and one where we've often thought about them slightly separately. Um, so to baseline the soil health, you can see the kind of complexity of what we're trying to do, and it's a really interesting farm with different approaches and including animals within that as well. So, you know, quite a scope to really modify the soil management. So what we're going to be doing there is baselining 13 fields um, using grids where appropriate. Obviously, the soil, the fields are, are differently zoned. Um, so we might be doing two or three zones per field um, to try and capture those differences. We'll be doing much more detailed assessments on the five fields, which we're also monitoring in detail for plant health. So really tracking the health of the plants through the year and looking at their nutritional status. So that will be really intensive so we can start to pick out patterns. But you can see there are some of the tests that we're going to be doing on the soils. So looking at quite simple things like penetrometers, the, the visual assessment of soil structures to really get that physical characteristics. Um, mapped out. 
And then, you know, worm counts is the way that we're looking at the, the soil health aspects as well. And again, there's lots of different tests there, um, some of which count nematodes, some of which count worms. But the point that we're starting to count something beneficial in the soil. Um, and then we're doing those very detailed soil tests in, in one particular zone in the field just because they're so much more intensive. And then we're using our soil health scorecard, which I'll move on to um, in a minute, which lets you plan ahead rather than just treating the symptoms of a soil. It's about, you know, planning a strategy going forward. And again, you see the, the sort of assessments we're doing there. So the basically grouped into the chemical, the physical and the biological and producing them together. Um, and including things like the moisture holding capacity, how quickly water drains away, and the, the soil microbial biomass. Um, so, you know, that creates that kind of three-way package of what we would consider a healthy, a healthy soil to be. And then if you can move to the next slide, Fiona, it shows the, the soil health card. Um, so what we have there, that's tiny on my screen, so I hope other people have stronger glasses than me. But essentially what we're doing there is just listing out the tests that we're doing. And we've got a number of examples along the top there of where there's a soil that's had lots of slurry, farmyard manure, so on and so forth. So different management approaches. And it really highlights in red there the ones where an intervention is, is really needed. The ones where you should monitor um, and aim to improve in yellow there. And then the, the ones that are appear healthier. But again, because it's a sort of combined score, there are lots of different ways to reach a similar green score. So it's a really kind of interesting feature that wherever you're starting with a soil, you're aiming to improve it. And again, the concept that you might try a piece of the field, say by a hedge that you know has been less impacted by traffic, and then compare that to the middle of a field and then just work to improve and the soil health. So this will be a really interesting thing to baseline over the farms. And then moving on to the disease uh, aspects, which I think there's a slide on the next one. Again, IPM metrics, a little bit like trying to measure soil health. So there are so many things that go integrate, into integrated pest management, including you know stewarded use of pesticides, that it's really hard to then say, you know, you're comparing apples with pears. How do you define what's good IPM and how do you do better? So we're keen to try this new IPM metric on the farm in Scotland. And this is a, a score that's been developed with farmers. So, for example, we know that farmers um, particularly value the preventative measures in IPM. So things like the rotation, um, things that actually avoid the risk. And that's actually a really powerful IPM tool and one that we probably don't get enough credit for. Um, we tend to think very much in season. So by weighting these scores, we've now got a score that lets us assess a field, measure IPM on a score out of 100. And it's been really interesting. So we know that, you know, the average score for farms is around 60, but you have some really high scorers, more like 85 who are picking up many of the IPM methods and you have some, you know, slower to pick up on those scores. So, again, the idea that there's no right or wrong answer here, but we will be scoring the fields and then seeing whether we can improve them um, during the course of the strategic farm work and rolling out that idea that, yes, IPM is kind of hard to conceptualise and measure, but actually we've got a method here and we can start to to move forward with it. So I think the next slide is, is moving on to Will's piece about lower inputs, which links nicely. Brilliant, just um, a couple of questions before we move on, um, Fiona. So sure. the IPM score that you were just talking about, is that something that other farmers can do? Yes. And um, so, so how do they do it? And how often should they do it? Is it something they do every year? Or is it something they'd look at across their rotation? Ideally, uh, once a year, and it's actually being picked up um, through the voluntary initiative and will be um, rolled out in, in schemes like um, Red Tractor and uh, uh, Scottish Quality Crop, where they're already um, filling in IPM plans, but without the, the metric tool. 
So those plans that people are hopefully used to now will be refreshed and updated and available. And that will let you have a score. Um, and then you can do different fields, compare um, different fields um, and look at how the farm is doing. So yes, the, absolutely this tool will be available and we'll be doing promotion around that, hopefully with HDB as well. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, thanks, Will. I think if you're going to take us through the um, the Manish Low Input trial at the East. Yep, I will do. So, um, as I said, we're sort of building on previous work uh, at the East that's been carried out over the last uh, four years uh, as a farm, as a Monta farm, and then the early years as a strategic farm. So, this is no different with the Manage Lower Inputs trial. So, um, we're really looking to determine the overall effect of fungicide applications on the level of disease control, how this um, is seen in the yield at the end of the year, and then actually cost out the productions um, of the strategies used. Um, so in previous years, I think it's been looked at in multiple multiple varieties uh, with a very a high and low approach, which and the high and low approach accompanies both the products and the rates and the timings, whereas we're going to split that all out a little bit this year. So again using a field scale approach so large plots um, 30 meters by 100 meters uh, with two replicates and then split out all the sort of the common timings your t0 t1 t2 t3 um, split them out um, individually and then also in combination with each other which totals seven seven different timings and then put them under a high and low cost regime um, th th throughout the season uh, this will sort of reflect the disease that we're seeing and the season that we're in. So it will be slightly reactive. We're not proposing to set out the exact program right now. Um, so it will be it will be reactive um, uh, at this stage. Uh, in terms of assessment, so we're sort of going to be really intensive uh, assessments yet again. So uh, during the season, uh, particularly in the spring, we'll be looking at see looking at growth stage. Uh, the exact growth stage of applications and then linking that back to things like NDVI, uh, the GAI, GAI to look at the, the, the green leaf index um, of a crop and how this effect, how this is linked to the disease assessment. So uh, two weekly uh, disease assessments regardless of application, how the disease is being tracked throughout the season. Uh, and then at the end of the season, we'll obviously look at the yield, as I said, um, we'll be using two methods. We're going to obviously use yield mapping because that's a technique that's uh, quite neat um, and allows us to work over the large number of plots and large areas. However, we'll also bring in our, our small little trials plot combine to take specific areas of the, of the crop and to give us a sample that will then be used to in the cost production calculation. So uh, instead of just looking at the pure yield, we'll also look at the quality scores that influence how much you can sell your grain for. Uh, and if any of the fungicide applications have, have, have affected those. Um, so we get a full cost of production, uh, not just on the amount of grain, but actually the quality that it that it um, ends up with. I think that's sort of sums up that work really. That's great. Thanks, Will. Um, I don't know whether, because obviously some of this work, um, when we were discussing it with um, with Brian and, and the group at the Strategic Farm East, it links quite nicely to some of the NIAB work that's been, you know, you've got a long-term data set, haven't you? So I don't know whether you've got, is there anything like, you know, take home message from that data set that you've you've got um, or, you know, that that you're hoping to build on through this trial? I don't know, you know, what, what would you expect to see here? Yeah, so we, we've got, a, I think it's up to 29 years now at, at the Morley Farms, the long-term monitoring of, of, of fungicide responses, um, which gives us a nice little, uh, we call this a cigarette graph trial. So we get a graph that gives you a response for your, your T0, your T1 and 2 together, and then your T3. So really this this sort of data set will, will build upon that and then give us um, give us an, an sort of, I suppose, an additional site, an additional place to, to monitor that. Um, and in uh, terms of the oh, varieties yeah. that you're using in, in that, um, in the in the Morley data, is that modern varieties as well as older varieties? Uh, the varieties change throughout the, so they they change every sort of three to four years uh, just to keep up with 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 the modern breeding. Um, um, and then so so I think at Brian's this year we're going to be using Gleam. Um, I think that was the move move in the fields, but 
Um, it's got reasonable set tour resistance and I think it's a seven, seven for yellow rust. So it's quite a strong package already, um, but certainly with, with some gaps in there that, um, that, re that requires treating. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I think if we move on to the West, we've got, um, it's a, as I say, you know, similar theme that we're looking at here, but a slightly different, different trial that we're looking at. And Anne's just going to take us through that now. Yeah, so this is a, a trial that Rob tried to get in the ground last year, but um, unfortunately the, the weather didn't uh, allow us to, to get it in the ground. Um, I'm glad to say that it's up and out and on. Uh, we're, we're all we're all set for this year. So um, basically that's the trial is looking at the way different varieties respond to different levels of disease control. So it's a split field tramline trial. Um, uh, so one half of the field uh, is in X days and the other is in six siskin. And then we've got three uh, treatments and a small area of untreated uh, uh, crop. So um, basically treatment treatment one is a is a, is a standard farm standard. So it's what um, Rob would um, basically be doing in a in a typical year. Um, and then treatment two is um, a, a low input program, basically a sort of um, lower risk averse uh, program. So actually sort of looking at um, what is happening in the season and actually being guided by that and perhaps taking a little bit more of a, a risk, uh, a risky approach. Um, and then treatment three is uh, we've, we've called it biorational. So it's looking at biological control, biostimulants, uh, that kind of thing. We're still uh, debating what those treatments actually might look like. Um, uh, we'll be deciding that early in the new year. Um, but uh, similar to, to the East, we'll be looking at how the, the, the crop uh, is growing. So different growth stage assessments and then disease assessments as well as, as, as the final yield. So that's that trial there. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring Fiona in. She's just popped a, a question comment in the in the chat box. So Fiona, would you mind just coming in and, and sharing a bit more information about that? Yes. So this was a, a trial series that we've just finished um, running over five years, kind of trying to add confidence around this, the scenarios in wheat where you can reduce fungicide inputs. So um, drilling date being one of the strong drivers of the disease risk of septoria risk and varietal resistance being the other one. Um, so that's actually been a really nice piece of work where um, we can see that um, the very high inputs um, are not necessarily and no more cost effective on those lower risk scenarios. Um, so that kind of often we are slightly frightened to reduce inputs. And, but the idea that there's a data set there where you can look at the weaker varieties and things like drilling date, I know are tricky to manipulate, but even if not deliberately done, you will still have wheat crops that are later drilled and consequently at slightly lower risk of septoria. So it's kind of situation specific, but that's, again, that will be referred to at the agronomy roadshows and things. So it's, it's a, a good uh, data source to look for. I think it's it's really interesting. Um, you know, you've mentioned Fiona the word confidence, and and Anne was saying just in in um, relation to to the trial at Rob's, we're still debating about what that the input programs are. Mm -hmm. How how do we as farmers and agronomists have that confidence? In a, you know, we can look back and say the harvest 2020 season. Yes, the weather was very challenging, but actually in terms of disease pressure, for most most of the country yes there were some people that had, had different slight different situations but in general it was a low disease pressure year i don't know you know obviously some people are more optimistic than pessimistic and does that play a part in how we look forward to harvest 2021 how, how do we have that confidence to say this is what we've learned this year this is how low we know we can go and this is what we're trying to going to try and do next year how, how do you think we we can get that <sighs> with difficulty obviously and, and clearly people have different attitudes to risk but you still start with uh and actually again it goes back to what i said about ipm the preventative things so actually we know by region what the very regular problems are and yes septoria is right up there for most of us 
So you have that kind of historic knowledge of what's relatively normal on your farm. And it might be a four years out of five year event that it's problematic, or it might be a one in five years. Um, and you have that kind of building awareness. So even when we get to our decision making in the spring on wheat, you've already got that knowledge of what the winter was like, whether disease was there in the crop, again, whether that particular crop was, you know, early drilled and is already, you know, you knew it was a weaker variety. So you're building that um, knowledge all the time. And reducing inputs doesn't have to just be about the dose. So it's also things like the, do you need a T naught? Um, and again, yellow rust is problematic. Um, but again, the way you're moving forward with the yellow rust ratings is giving a little bit more confidence that we know how they'll behave. Um, so that kind of, do you need a T naught? Take that timing in or out. Um, what's the appropriate dose at T1? If it was early drilled, you can, put a, a higher dose on then and then think again at flag leaf and again by then you've got the knowledge of what the weather was like building up so it's just fewer generic this sounds really obvious but fewer generic programs where you've decided in advance and much more of that you know adjusting and changing as we go and and moving on to you know effective chemistry and so on is part of that too brilliant thank you I think, um, you know, thinking about effective chemistry and, and incorporating, um, you know, different approaches to, to management of, of inputs leads us nicely on to the next trial that Anne's going to take us through, which is um, the weed management trial at the West. So, Anne, if we come back to you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so there was a great webinar, I think, on Tuesday that covered this um, um, in more detail than what, that what I'm going to say now. But. Uh, so this uh, is a trial uh, that Rob's doing um, and it, it, it's really looking to see if he can create a stay, stale seed bed without glyphosate actually. Um, it, so the trial has been undertaken um, in a, a high black grass pressure field um, and he's basically tried um, different two different cultivation um, methods um, uh, as an alternative to glyphosate um, in establishing, ahead of establishing his uh, winter wheat. Um, the field is, is quite variable in terms of its soil type, so we're actually going to be looking at the, the variation in soils. And we've arranged the treatments, so we've got four replicates of, of three treatments to try and capture um, the variation and take account of that variation in soil type um, and look at the interaction there. Um, and so we basically, he's basically established um, a, a, a crop just with um, uh, the power harrow and glyphosate. Um, and then he's tried two different cultivations, a duckfoot uh, springtime and the Vadastat col coltus. Don't ask me about the different bits of kit, please. <laughs> um, uh, but those two have had two passes of those, those cultivation treatments and no glyphosate. Speaking to him, it actually, um, his problem this year is volunteers um, rather than black grass. Um, uh, so we're basically looking at weed pressure throughout the year um, and looking at the, the final impact um, on yield. So that's that trial. Thanks, Emily. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks. So we're going to have a substitution trial. I think Fiona, if you can just um, just take us through, you know, a bit of the background to this. I think we've actually got David Aglin on the call as well. So. We do. I, I saw David's name in the in the list there. Yes. Yeah. So this goes back to what I was saying about linking the um, the soil health and the nutrition with the the plant health. So this is a really interesting area. And in one of the fields, we were also doing some of the detailed assessments. So we're trying to, you know, link things here. Um, we're doing some specific trials looking at, at the nutrition in the crop uh, in a replicated way. So again, trying to build on the tramline concept. So we've got a bit of um, statistical power there to really test what we're doing. And you can see the sort of um, treatments and interventions that we're that we're thinking of. So, you know, the, the untreated um, controls, the standard farm um, fertilizer um, treatments, and then 
moving forward to look at the kind of real time um, crop and soil nutrition. So um, testing the soil, uh, the, the plants as we go um, using um, these BRICS units. So just a really quick test to see what the status is and then whether we intervene at that point. So that's very, very regular testing through the season to see whether that continual popping up of the plant's nutritional status is helpful. And again, you can see that we're looking at, you know, a whole range of physiological assessments there. Um, so, you know, simple things like um, growth stages, but trying to look at the, the biomass of the crop that's there. So plant and tiller counts, um, ground cover, um, green area index, um, the amount of, you know, um, green tissue that's there to absorb um, light, the nutrient status. Um, again, we're looking at the photosynthetic capacity there with those SPAD units. Um, doing that tissue and, and sap testing. So again, you know, um, testing sap is a is a newer concept. So we're referencing that with more traditional, if you like, methods of laboratory tissue testing in quite an intensive way. And then we're also tracking um, the foliar disease um, in the trials. And I mean, this will be really interesting and you would imagine it will be different for different diseases. So, you know, we know that some diseases like um, mildew are, you know, promoted by um, high uh, nutrient status. Others, you know, septoria, if the crop is lush and thick, we know that that enhances the kind of um, um, environment for, for septoria. And then others like, say, ramularia in um, barley, we know that that's actually induced by stress. And, and so, the, again, there could be a kind of interesting piece there about how the nutritional status of the crop uh, affects a disease like ramularia, which is quite triggered by, by stress. So this will be a really interesting uh, area to work on on the farm. It was really interesting that um, the podcast, Brian, I think it was last week we recorded it and um, we we're chatting about um, you know the the different trials and I'm kind of coming back to that confidence things that we were talking about earlier and and talking about his managed lower input trial and, and it does relate to this and I think someone said to him you know what was his um what was like the point that was the most scary in in working out how to adjust the inputs and things and for him he said it was it wasn't actually the fungicides um for for the disease management trial that we were talking about before um it was actually the nitrogen Mm -hmm. That was the scariest kind of moment where he was like, you know, having to make that decision in the season. Um, so, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. Um, I mean, as I said, no, David's on the call. I don't know whether if he, if he wanted to say anything in terms of that, you know, the, the first lives of the nutrient management and kind of the inputs that, that we're looking at on this trial. I don't know, Fiona, if you know what what inputs we're looking at here. We, well, we haven't defined that, but it does reflect the kind of interest in that farm in regenerative agriculture. Um, and again, it's an interesting farm because of that ability to, you know, there's animals there as well. So it creates something that we don't have on every arable farm. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, we haven't defined the actual inputs, but I absolutely agree the kind of prospect of um, you, there's no way back from a, a wrong nitrogen decision. Yeah. David's put his hand up, I see. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. can add some detail around that, David. That would be great. Um, yes, the nitrogen one is is interesting. We've been caught out the last couple of years by trying to be clever and um, applying lower doses earlier on and trying to meter it out through the season. Of course, if you get ten weeks with no rain, mm. that backfires quite rapidly. So we'll. we'll We'll, we'll um, take a few steps back on that one maybe next year. But it was interesting, the, the nutrition, if, if you think about what you were saying, Fiona, you know, the mildew is, is nitrogen and nutrition. The lush yeah. crop in the wheat for septoria, again, it's possibly excess nutrition. A lot of it stems to excess nutrition. And mm -hmm. we had that fascinating talk from Georgina um, uh, Keys the other night uh, yes. about the managed lower inputs, mm -hmm. and you know when she's sitting there saying, "We've proven that this works in 
albeit it was a controlled environment, and her examples was, was with the, the Ponsettias, you think, well, actually, okay, yes, we've got a slightly less controlled environment, but the principles will still apply. And I'm really excited to see how we can pan this out over the six years and, and actually get a handle on this, because I, I think yeah, it's a, yeah. a game changer for the industry as a whole, um, if, if we can get some fact on it. Um, yeah, no, you're right. It'll be amazing. Really good. Mm. Yeah, so sure. I'll put my hand down now. Thanks, Thanks David. David. OK, so I think we're, we're going to move on now to the um, flower strips, pest and natural enemy work that's happening across, um, well, multiple farms. But we, we've got the replicated um, field scale work that's going on at the west and the east. So I think Anne's going to take us through the plan um, and then Will's going to add anything in. That's right. Yeah. OK, again, a good webinar yesterday um, by Mark um, and the team um, discussing this. Um, so this is ongoing work. This has already been established at both East and West, um, where we've been uh, measuring uh, pests and beneficials um, last year. Um, so in the West, uh, so the, the design is pretty much the same in both, both uh, farms. Uh, where we've got three fields, uh, a farm standard um, uh, without any uh, flowering strips, um, a field with uh, uh, edge, field edge, um, field margins basically with flower strips, and then one with um, uh, both uh, field margins and within the field uh, flowering strips. So Rob's over in the West was established um, about 18 months ago, 2019. I think um, in the East, Brian got them in just this last spring. So Rob's slightly ahead of the game, um, but they're, they're establishing well now. And there's some, some good data uh, being generated. Uh, so we've got some sort of baseline data from last year. And this coming year, we'll be doing some more um, detailed assessments um, so, uh, over time, so repeated measurements of, of pests uh, and their, their, their natural uh, enemies. So things like aphids, slugs, uh, beetles, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and then within um, within the fields where we've got the, the, the within field margins, we're also looking at um, what impact that has on yield as well. Uh, and one of the other we're we're just looking at is um, which is new um, is looking at the carbon storage potential carbon storage in the soils just establishing a baseline really so looking at what soil carbon we've got down um, to 60 centimeters depth within the flower strips and within the field itself um, and the idea is these are going to be in place for the whole of the strategic strategic farm program and we'll we'll look at these changes over time so that that's that's all I've got to say. Will, have you got anything else to add? Uh, no, not really. Um, um, not really. Um, I think certainly in the East, we're looking at things like BYDV scores throughout the autumn as well, just to look at if there's an effect on uh, viruses uh, in, in the crop. But otherwise, I think it's I say, a very similar methodology, which is uh, nice to have and to be able to replicate it two sides of the country. I think we had um, had a really interesting question came in um, on the on the webinar that that Anne was talking about that that happened yesterday, and it was about around is there the potential that actually these flowering strips become reservoirs for pests, and natural enemies as well, um, and it, it links quite nicely actually to um, we HDB have got a PhD student that's just started um, and is looking at how we can use these infield flower strips that hope, hopefully, um, and, and we've seen in, in other research projects, a reservoir for beneficials and natural enemies. And actually, if you plant a trap crop of, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I was quickly trying to look, I can't remember whether the project's looking at Maris Widgen or Maris Huntsman. Um, my brain's failing me this morning, but I can get, I can let everyone know the details afterwards. Aphids are more likely to land on on that variety compared to some of the modern RL varieties. We've had a research project that, that looked at that. And can we actually plant these, um, you know, the the Maris um, widgeon, I think it might be, variety next to the flowering strip because the aphids are more likely to land on that variety 
then next to where those natural enemies are. So it almost acts as a catch a trap crop in that field in the location where then the natural enemies, you know, don't have to move as far out into the field. So I think it's I think it's really interesting. And I think, you know, Brian, Rob and, and probably David will agree, it's how you integrate this into the into the wider picture as well. So they're not they're not going to solve all your problems on their own. But it's thinking about the soil, how thinking about, you know, how they integrate into the landscape as well. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing where this one goes as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so if we move on, I think we're, we're sticking with you, Will. Yep. Um, and just just to give us an update on, on what's been going on on the, the cover cropping trial and, and some of the assessments. I think I saw this picture from one of the updates that your field team sent. So um, do you want to tell us what you're doing here? Uh, yeah, so um, again, following on from uh, some of the excellent work of, of, of Anne's team uh, looking at um, uh, cover crops and their uptake of nitrogen uh, through a season and its effect on the next next year's crop. Um, we're looking at the crop after the after the following crop. So after the spring barley, there's now a herbal grass uh, for, for seed in, in, in the two fields. And uh, the picture on the screen is our Jimney um, with a soil corer uh, on, on the back. So that can go down to 90 centimetres um, and automates the, the process of, of, of our soil coring. So it saves a, saves a few backs and, uh, and, and painful arms at the end of the day. Um, uh, but also allows us to, to actually get more samples throughout a day um, if, 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 if necessary to so increase our output. So here we're, we're continuing with the same position. So in each field, um, I should probably explain the two fields. There's, there's two fields. Um, which were each split in two. One had uh, was ploughed, and then the cover crop was established into the ploughed land. And the other one, we, the cover crop was established into just into the stubble. Um, as I said, they were then uh, destroyed and then taken through to harvest with spring barley, which was under under sown with 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 the grass. Um, and we're now at that stage uh, that we're taking our soil mineral nitrogen um, samples, which will be taken um, three times in the season. Uh, in each of the same geographic points that was used for the previous year's monitoring. So that's three points per treatment, so six in each in each field. Um, we'll also continue monitoring drain water from, from each of the fields to see how uh, the levels of nitrogen, if, if, if they change or if they're different from each from each areas of the areas of the field. Um, the previous year's work showed that you need a cover crop to keep your nitrate levels below the EC, EC um, recommended nitrate levels so we'll see how that if, if, if that benefit has continued on to this year um, and then this is supported by other uh, sort of physical characteristics of, um, of, of the soil so vest scores penetrometer assessments bulk density um, and some of the topsoil nutrients and how they've been affected by the by the cover crops and the legacy of I mean and the legacy of those uh, and of course we'll we'll take this all, all the way through to harvest um, I think Presumably, the the yield monitor works with with, with the grass seed, um, but we're also uh, going to be doing crop biomass throughout the season as well to to look at both volume and weight, but also the uh, nitrogen content in that. And again, uh, that's going to be three times in the season. So a really thorough investigation of um, of the legacy of the of the cover crops. Brilliant, thanks, Will. And um, one of the things that we we um, we've got this year as well is looking at these solids state nitrate sensors that's a bit of a mouthful to say um, yes. <laughs> and I had a question that came in um, previously around how obviously Brian's got his drainage network and, and the way that the trial's been designed means that we can sample the drainage water from that outflows under the different treatments but how um, and you know in the nitrate sensors what they're going to show us is is that the, the nitrate concentrations in the soil profile and, and how they're moving down the profile rather than just, you know, from the drainage samples. What other methods could people use, um, you know, to, to capture that? I think we've talked in the past about things like porous pots, so I don't know um, if you've got any more information. Can people get that kind of information from soil cores? Um, what, what's the alternative method for, um, for capturing that? I think if it's okay, I'll hand this one over to Anne. I think uh, I'm a, a weed scientist, so I think I'll, I'll hand this over to Anne if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so measuring drainage water, obviously Brian is basically going out, as we know, with buckets and, and standing in drains in all sorts of conditions and, and sending off samples to labs. Porous pots is a, a, another way of doing it. They don't tend to work uh, so well on a, a heavy cracking soil. 
um, they're better in light land. Um, but uh, actually, as a simple guide, you could just take uh, soil melon, the, the deep core in, um, in the autumn and then in the spring as a, just a sort of idea of how your soil melon sample, your, your nitrogen level in the soil has changed um, over that winter to pe winter period. Um, and then also looking at how much um, nitrogen is actually recovered in the, the cover crop is, is, is quite a, a, a good in indication of what you've potentially saved um, and actually what will be then um, released uh, to the subsequent crop. So that's just basically chopping the, the crop to, to ground level um, from a known area and uh, uh, weighing it, drying it, weighing it. Um, and sending a sample off for nitrogen analysis, that can be a fairly simple, simple and effective way. And I know Brian, that's something Brian has been doing and we've been doing for him as well. Yeah. Brilliant, thank yeah. you. Um, Will, we've got a question to come back to you on the soil nitrate sensors. Are you able to provide us a bit more information uh, um, about them? I think working with the researcher John Innes, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. So um, I can't give you exact detail. It's sort of still in a beta testing phase of the of the of the source centers. But yes, so we're working with um, with someone from John Innes who is going to kindly provide them uh, as part of the testing system. So they'll be um, put in the crop. Um, I think it's sort of from from March. So I think so from February to sort of April time to, to look at the real time change in the in the soil um, mineral nitrogen as it moves through the profile. So but um, I'm sure if I if they'd like to message me directly, I can get some more specific details on that. Yeah, I think um, so it's Tony Miller's the researcher that, that yep. you're working with there. Um, so um, Delana, I think, yeah, we can send you that that information afterwards if, if you're interested in finding out more. Awesome. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so from cover cropping in the east, we're going to hop across to the west and and just go through the, the catch cropping. As, as Anne said, um, you know, we've had had a good webinar on this earlier in the week um but just just provide us with you know any more updates from that and that'd be great yeah so this is a, a a trial that was sort of added in actually as a consequence of um rob not being able to get a crop on all his land uh last year so um because of the weather so we took advantage of that and rather than just leaving it fallow um we uh We've been looking at two alternatives to leaving it fallow. One, just finding what saved seed you've got in your shed. So some farm saved beans and barley and um, compared that with a, uh, a seed mix that was supplied by our AGT seeds. And this seed mix was just a, quite simple for celia and oil radish. But the idea being there, one that could that has good rooting and could potentially help with restructuring the soil and also has good nutrient retention so a, one for sort of mopping up any nitrogen released during um, the growing season so um, that was that was uh, established last year and we're now in the, the stage where we've got a winter wheat crop in the ground um, and uh, going forward, this current year is really looking at how that winter cr wheat crop responds on the different treatments. I know that when Brian, when Rob um, drilled it, he certainly noticed a difference in within the ease with which he cultivated the, the different strips where we had the catch crop. Um, it was a lot drier and easier, less horsepower is needed. Um, so we, we've been out last week or the week before and just done some soil structural assessments. Um, they're still sitting on my laptop, so I can't give you an update on those, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, obviously we've had quite a bit of rain and I know um, Rob was dubious as to whether actually uh, there would be a benefit or whether we'd lost that benefit rainfall but um, I'm really interested to see how this one pans out uh, so we'll be doing some more measurements in the spring looking at soil nitrogen supply um, going ahead of his, his fertilizer plan for the year um, and then looking at final yields at harvest so th this one will be quite interesting to, to follow through. Brilliant thanks anything to with you just to you know, provides with a, a quick overview of the cultivation trial. Obviously, this is a long term trial that's been in the the ground at the west from the start of the project. Um, so just just to go over the assessments that we're continuing to do. Yeah. And, and again, maybe any of the ones that we're adding in. 
Yeah. Uh, Fiona, can you click on to the next slide, please? Great. OK, so yeah, as Emily said, this is this is a six year trial. So we're now in year three of, of the trial. So we've had uh, winter wheat. We tried to get oilseed rape in the ground last year and uh, ended up with a, a spring beans. And then this year uh, we've got winter wheat and uh, yeah, it's all going well, which is great. So um, four different treatments, uh, a direct drill treatment, uh, a shallow, uh, five centimetre depth uh, cultivation, the farm standard, which is 15 centimetres depth, and then a deeper cultivation down to 30 centimetres. And what we've been doing um, uh, on this trial today, we've been monitoring changes in soil properties each year. So things like organic matter content, earthworms, um, soil structure. But then we've also wanted to look at how this relates to how the crop roots um, and and then performs in terms of nutrient capture. So um, we're doing some very simple rooting assessments in the spring. Just uh, we call that shovelomics, where we just dig up a plant and measure various things like root length and angle. Um, and then this year we're actually looking at deep rooting um, at harvest. So going down to uh, 100 centimetres, I think. Uh, and measuring root length density and just seeing if there's a relationship between some of the soil properties that we're measuring and and the rooting that we're getting and whether that's a, as a consequence of the different cultivations that we've got. Something that we're adding in this year is again looking um, at carbon stocks, obviously with the interest in um, carbon sequestration on in soils and what farmers can do um, towards net zero. Um, uh, uh, cultivation practices is something that um, um, there's been a lot of discussion about. So we're, we're, we're really seeing this measurement as a sort of uh, baseline just to see what we've got to start with and we'll, we'll repeat it again at the end. So we're looking at carbon stocks in each of these treatments down to 60 centimetres depth. Uh, and profiling that to see if there's a difference in the, the way the carbon is dis distributed. Uh, yeah, soil carbon, not co soil carbon. I've just seen that <laughs> on the slide. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's that trial. That's great. It's a really good trial and it's really great that we can follow that through for the whole six years. Thanks, Annie. <laughs> OK, I think we'll um, we'll move on to the the final slide in terms of the trials. We've got some interesting questions coming in, so so we'll come back to those. But Will, do you want to just run us through through um, through this final one? This is the marginal land work at the east. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think this is a really interesting and slightly uh, different part of the project. It's very much um, uh, desk based, but um, certainly that makes it uh, more uh, a different dimension to, to some of the work. And really the, the key aim is to use sort of pre-existing farm data of which um, Brian has an excellent excellent record keeping system so uh, that includes some of the soil scans the yield mats um, and including some of the, the softer data around sort of like the establishment type sort of things are difficult to actually quantify but we we, we have records of um, and then we'll sort of analyze this all together and look to select some of the areas that might be suitable for uh, for taking out production and that might be uh, when in the rotation or uh, um, obviously when these sort of discussions come up you always sort of talk about taking out the wet corners or evening up your field shape to make working easier um, but obviously we'll look across this over the whole rotation so if a combination of things like a particular crop um, and a particular field uh, sort of yields poor fields then that might uh, be able to isolate that particular combination as a candidate for increasing the uh, for example like the margin areas or put in other environmental uh, measures um, uh, rather than taking out other productive or more productive areas of, of, of the farm and obviously hopefully being being paid for it through something like the elm system uh, scheme that will will be coming in shortly although obviously limited detail on it so uh, difficult to exactly say what we could replace the production with but um, we can get hazard a reasonable guess so that's what we're sort of beginning to do now over, over this winter, pull all that data together and um, look to identify these areas. Um, alongside that, we'll look at some of the drainage maps and, and produce sort of like a map of the water networks on, on Brian's farm in the east. Um, and therefore, that will also help us to identify areas in which the, the, the best places to protect the waterways are 
um, in terms of water flow and nutrient outlet. And so that links back into some of the, the, the drainage water testing that Brian's been doing over the last three or four years. And you can use that backlog of data as well as evidence being produced um, over this year. So that might isolate areas that particularly should have cover crops or catch crops in. Um, so it's sort of tying together a lot of the work that's already been done uh, into a, a sort of like a farm management map um, for, 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 for Brian. Um, and then sort of finally, and I think that uh, Anne just touched on sort of like net zero there, and um, we'll try to add, add, add attribute sort of like an energy input for each of the sort of crops um, and areas across the field. So add that into the cost produ uh, crop production, um, which obviously depending on establishment method, um, if you use a cover crop, how you harvest it, it dates, etc. Uh, and then this could then sort of become a requirement potentially if we're having to demonstrate sort of carbon neutral neutrality um, within agriculture. So it's sort of again um, something that's, that might be coming into the industry. So so looking at it at the right at the beginning. Um, yes. I'll probably add that I think so David Clark is our lead lead on this and he's on the podcast which Emily mentioned earlier. So when that's out, I think that's a that'll be a thoroughly interesting listen. We've, we've got him speaking on one of our sessions at Agronomy Week as well in a couple of weeks time. So, um, so that would be good. I think the thing that I found really interesting with this one was um, when we discussed, you know, the, the monetary compensation that's required. Um, and as you said, like we don't know the details of ELMS yet, so we don't know what that will be through the ELMS route. But actually what it does, and, and hopefully this uh, provide insight into, is, is that level of monetary compensation. And then it's it's identifying where that compensation comes from and that could be you know internally in terms of diversification or it could be direct payment as a you know as a result of putting in certain initiatives so for me i think that that's the really powerful bit it's, it's providing that evident evidence of actually doing these me measures costs x amount and we can put that that figure on so i, th I think that would be really powerful okay brilliant thanks everyone um we've got some some questions coming in so um i think if we just move on to to the holding slide the q a holding slide please fiona um so let me just go back up the chat we've um we've got a question that, that came in on the ipm score um and and asking if you already use the most appropriate rotation and sowing date for your situation is it possible that you could start with a low score but and not always be able to show any improvement despite doing the right thing? So Fiona, did you want to come back on that one? Yes, yeah, so there are a couple of questions around that. So if you, the, the important thing about that, if it's tricky to adjust rotation, it's your starting point. So you're baselining and you're improving against that. So it's not about the score per se. Um, you're still going right. Okay, my rotation is limited because of my situation, but there are still these other things I can do to improve. We then had another question that was about, okay, well, what if I've got a really high score at the start? Is there very little I can do? So those preventative things, the really impactful things, are the most, the biggest sort of jumps you can make. As you get closer to 100, it then becomes more about the small incremental gains from, you know, things like cover crops, beneficials, um, lowering your fungicide, your nutritional inputs. So, you know, clearly when you get closer to 100, you can't make a jump of, you know, 20% forward, but you can still creep forward. And, you know, the sort of trajectory we're on with more biologicals and things appearing, you can imagine that that piece will keep um, going. So, yeah, just to convey that idea that it's a baseline, a starting point that you're improving against. But I would hate people to think, well, I'm already scoring 90, so there's nothing I can do. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got a question that's come in. I'll probably direct this to Anne, if that's OK, um, around the what contributes to soil carbon um, and the role of mycorrhizal fungi and whether we take that into account. I know we don't specifically measure it, um, but Anne, I don't know whether you wanted just to just to come in there. No, we don't specifically measure mycorrhizal carbon. Um, obviously, it depends on what crop you've got in as to how the my mycorrhizae are, are performing. But um, 
but um, we will be measuring total organic carbon so it will capture that that carbon um, within that measurement so it's the total amount of organic carbon whether that be from crop residues um, other organisms microorganisms in the soil and including um, my mycorrhizae but we, we're not looking at specifically per se obviously one would guess that cultivation has a big impact here on the, um, the mycorrhizal carbon element of that 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 total carbon brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. So final question then, and I'll come to each of you in turn. James has asked a question around, um, you know, obviously at the Strategic Farms we're doing lots of assessments and, and we've talked about um, intensive assessments that we're doing on some of the trials. But which of the assessments being done at each of the sites would deliver the best value for money outcomes for other similar farms to do for themselves? And why are they the most important? So I don't know whether our speakers can choose their their top one, or maybe maybe we'll say our our, our top three. Um, but Anne, if I come to you first, and then, <laughs> then I'll come to the others. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, well, I mean, I'm a soil scientist, so I might be a bit biased, but um, um, and I know that I'll, I'll I'll take my soil science hat off, of, and and I know that Mark yesterday was. Uh, was showing some really simple measures to look at pests and uh, na their natural enemies that are very would be very cheap and relatively simple to do for, um, for a farmer and they're definitely something worthwhile. From the soils front actually again something really cheap and easy to do is just a visual soil assessment of structure and actually by just look getting your spade out and and looking at the um the structure of your soils and at the same time counting your earthworms looking at the layers of compaction um looking to see how your crops are rooting um the colour, the smell of the soil, actually just very simple things that you, you don't have to send a sample off to the lab. They are something that's very cheap and easy to do and definitely worthwhile doing. If you wanted to spend a bit of money, then actually analysing for organic matter content is, is a really good thing to do, but only on a like a rotational basis, sort of every four years. So again, that's relatively, relatively cheap. Um, if you're using cover crop, understanding how much nitrogen is in that cover crop, just looking at the percentage cover actually of the cover crop can tell you a lot about how well that's performed in terms of mopping up your nitrogen. So there are quite a few simple things to do and easy things to do um, that don't involve much money. Great, great, thanks. Will, what would be your, your favourite on-farm assessment? Um. I think it's not maybe specifically an actual the specific assessment, but actually um, when we talk about some of the soil scores, you're going to actually attributing an actual measurable score to it. It's like the best score, you're, you're coming out with a number um, or a description. So I think that should be better applied to things like disease. We say a low disease year. Well, what does that look like on your farm? So actually going out and I'm sure ACB have some excellent sort of methodology for scoring. Obviously, we use it in our trials. Um, but something along those lines to actually understand what a low disease year looks like in your farm and actually tracking that in numerous years will give you a better um, uh, metric to, to work against for when you decide to drop your fungicide or not and actually um, sort of almost getting like getting drift oh it's a low disease year it might be but it might just be that that's in that particular field is it, that's the one you're looking at so uh, and it's the same for, for anything say so same for weeds so same for things like black grass or any other weed, weed you might find actually quantifying what you've got before and after your herbicide rather than saying oh there's loads here that's that's not trackable over over time so putting numbers to things uh, it, and, they get, and they can be simple things but putting the numbers to them is probably my my tip and I guess that then allows you to benchmark year on year how, how the management decisions you're making uh, are having an impact as well as the environmental factors. So that's great. Thanks, Will. Um, and Fiona, what are your thoughts on this one? The joy of coming last where everybody's picked the obvious ones. So I think I would just reiterate the importance of the basics. So, you know, the soil health and structure, absolutely crucial. Um, and then you know, I was going to say something along the lines that Will said that, you know, that again, the plant health basics of just looking what's actually happening and building that experience of what happens in fields or even parts of fields 
really simple to do um, and really obvious, but the win-win of then just tailoring what you're doing to the actual um, risk in the field is, you know, easy but simple. Brilliant, thank you. Great, so I'm conscious of time. We've run just a little bit over. Um, so thanks thanks to everyone for, for bearing with us. If we move on to the next slide, I've just got a few, few updates and signposting to share with you. So um, on the screen here, you can see we've got our, our three strategic cereal farm hosts. Um, you can find out more information about everything that we're doing throughout the year. Um, future events, fingers crossed they'll be face to face in, in the near future. But if not, obviously we'll be continuing to deliver um, all of that content to you online. You can see the um, the, the web page um, endings there. But if you just go to the main hdb.org.uk website um, and then search for farm excellence, you'll be able to then navigate through the website and, and find the specific details of specific web pages for each of those farms. Move on to the next slide, please, Fiona. Um, as, as you've seen, we've got our three host farms already. If you've enjoyed this week and enjoyed what you've heard and been inspired to, to get involved, um, we actually have an opportunity at the moment to um, for applications from farmers who want to host the four strategic cereal farms. So the, the applications open on Monday the 23rd. It's an online application form. Again, if you go to hdb.org.uk forward slash farm dash excellence forward slash recruitment, you'll be able to find the application form on there. If you've got any questions or queries, please do get in touch. Um, we are looking for farms in uh, a farm in a specific region. So you can see those listed there, um, either Yorkshire, Lancashire, Dorset, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, Hampshire, or Oxfordshire. It's basically to fill, fill the gaps in the north of England and the south of England with our strategic farm network. So um, you know, if you've if you've enjoyed uh, the sound of some of the trials that that the hosts are currently doing and, and want to to see that on your own farm, then then we'd be really pleased to hear from you. So mentioned it um, earlier, um, referenced the HDB Agronomy Week. So that starts a week on Monday. So starting on Monday, the 30th of November through to Friday, the 4th of December. Every day we've got a series of webinars. Um, you know, live stream sessions, we've got recorded videos for you to enjoy. Um, uh, day one and day two, so the Monday and the Tuesday focused on cereals, nor seeds, agronomy, and then the final three days focusing on potatoes, agronomy. Um, there's lots of topics that we're covering. This is replacing what would have been our agronomists conference. So get get booked into that. Um, you can find out more information, hdb.org.uk forward slash events, forward slash agronomy dash week dash 2020. Um, any questions with that, again, please feel free to get in touch. Our um, regional arable knowledge exchange team, obviously still um, still working, still delivering content on, on um, our online platforms. Um, they're always happy to hear from, from you, so please get in touch. Their details are there um, and it's slightly small on my screen. But um, if you, as I said, if you've got any questions, drop me an email um, and uh, I can direct you to, to the relevant person. I think all it remains for me to say is thank you to our three speakers. Thank you to Anne, Will and Fiona. Thank you to my colleague Fiona Geary, who's been busy in the background, making sure that we uh, have moved through the slides uh, properly. So, so thank you, Fiona. Um, and thank for joining it's um it's been great to to use a slightly different platform have those questions coming in um and to, to have that discussion looking ahead to the harvest 2021 trials so all that leaves me to say is uh, thank you i hope you've enjoyed it uh, i hope you have a good rest of the day and ha have a great weekend and hopefully see you soon thank you very much bye everyone